Okay, welcome to uh, the next class in the arts and literature section. And so the theme of today's class is breath. And I wanted to use this class to join the dots between some of the most urgent social issues of our time, uh, issues that um, I think can help concretize the idea of environmental justice that has been a motif throughout this section of the course. Um, so that's one thing. I wanted to ground the, the struggle for environmental justice in the matter of breath. The second thing I wanted to do is to underscore something that we looked at from the beginning of the course with the discussion of the changing symbolic power of polar bears and glaciers, is to think through the power of the symbolic in movements for social change, and in this case, the symbolism of breath. And the third thing I wanted to do was to double down on the discussion we had on Monday about intersectional thinking, the importance of intersectional thinking. So remember when we looked at Wangari Mathai and the Greenbelt movement, we were looking at the, the way rural women uh, impoverished rural women are positioned in society and the intersectional identities and the degree to which those women were made vulnerable by those identities, but also those identities provided them a kind of camouflage um, because they were discounted as political actors, a camouflage uh, beneath which they could organize and mobilize. Okay? So today we'll again be looking at the question of intersectional identities and their roles in movement for social change. I wanted to start just by, by uh, connecting with our own breaths, and I'd like you to breathe in for six and breathe out for eight. So just pace your breath, and to do that five times, and to just get a sense of where your breath is, and to renew that acquaintance with your breath. So of all the life-sustaining activities, breath is the one that we can least afford to postpone. So if we think of the need for water, for food, uh, for human company, for shelter, all of those can be deferred to a greater extent than breath. Um, and I think one of the reasons why um, the motif of breath and the symbolism of breath has such a powerful urgency to it and such a uh, symbolic freight. One of the reasons is that probably all of us at some point in our life have felt uh, a shortage of breath, whether you're, you're being tumbled under, under the ocean, whether you uh, have an asthma attack, whether you're in uh, uh, badly polluted air. Okay, So the motif of breath is fundamentally linked to the physiology of breath, okay? And if we think of the scale of breathing, um, on the one hand, you have the alveoli, you have the, 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 the porous movement of oxygen into the bloodstream at a micro level, and at a macro level, uh, people talk semi-metaphorically of the earth breathing of the planet itself as a breathing organism. So this is the foundation, for instance, of Gaia philosophy. And many, many of you will have seen the, the image of Earth breathing, uh, which is the, the seasonal pulse uh, as we have the advance and retreat of vegetation. 
Uh, I, I attached a video at the end of this lecture that you can look at if you, don't, if you haven't seen that. Um, and that seasonal um, difference is most dramatic at the poles. Uh, we have the, the most acute seasonal variations and least dramatic at the tropics. We have less uh, dramatic seasonal variations. But in the, in the videos of that, the, the movement back and forth of uh, vegetation and ice and of uh, exhalation and inhalation, the, the, the way those videos are presented is through the kind of um, metaphor of breath and where you see those uh, differences, seasonal variations becoming more acute, more exaggerated. Uh, scientists often talk about a, a planetary breathing arrhythmia, a, a disturbance in the rhythm, in the planetary rhythm. Okay? So one of the things we have been talking about in this section of the course is scale, the challenges of scale. And breathing is something that um, speaks both to the micro and the macro. Okay? Uh, humans, unlike many other species, uh, breathe involuntarily. So it's not, uh, if you take, for instance, cetaceans, you take whales, dolphins, porpoises, before they dive, they make a point of breathing. It, 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 it requires an active mobilization of, of the breath. Whereas we breathe 25,000 times a day, typically, without thinking about breathing. And so when we're thinking about breathing, it's either a breathing emergency, uh, you, you're threatened with asphyxiation for one reason or another, or you're consciously trying to control anxiety, control the adrenal system through, um, through breathing, through meditation, through yoga. Um, and so otherwise, uh, the great majority of our breaths in, every, in any given day are involuntary. Um, so I'm wanting to connect the foreground of breathing, of the individual breathing, and the background of the, of the, of the climate crisis. Uh, and Focusing on the last two years, if we think of three of the, the biggest crises, the biggest, the most urgent uh, political matters of the last couple of years, we have COVID, we have mass breathing, assisted breathing, ventilators. Uh, we have climate change intensified wildfires, uh, more and more smoke choked communities from California and Oregon to Siberia to Greece and Italy and Turkey. Um, and third, Black Lives Matter um, mobilizing in large part through this very simple uh, slogan of I can't breathe. Uh, so the link between masked breathing and murder by asphyxiation, okay? And as I said, the, the breath is so fundamental to mammalian life that uh, it's not surprising that uh, breathing permeates our register of dead metaphors, of metaphors that were once poetic but that we don't think about any longer. Uh, so for instance, if your parents are texting you every five minutes to see how your classes are going, you know, you might say to them, well, mom and dad, I, I really love, I know you love me, but this is suffocating love. I need some breathing room. Or you talk about somebody arriving at a party and uh, sucking all the oxygen out the room. Or um, in the Emma Lazarus poem that uh, in, in, in uh, Ellis Island, uh, uh, welcoming immigrants, uh, the, uh, one of the phrases there is yearning to breathe free. Okay, so the idea of the association of uh, freedom of breath with uh, a, a democratic freedoms, the aspiration of democratic freedoms. So as Rachel Kite puts it, you can't isolate yourself from a pandemic and you also can't isolate yourself from climate change. So one of the things that has come to the fore in the last couple of years is this question of individual freedom in relation to collective good, the collective survival. And this is something I know that you've talked about in the ethics section of the course as well. Okay. Um, and so the idea that, uh, that individual choice is not always a sufficient guarantor of collective liberties. 
So I came across this image um, last year, uh, and, and I found it very striking. We're all in the same storm. We are not all in the same boat. So when I first saw it, I thought, oh, obviously this is about the climate emergency, where uh, you have a universal crisis that weighs unequally on different populations, on different communities, okay? Uh, and I thought this was a very effective image of the, the, the person rowing in a, in, in a, in a, in a, in a little boat versus uh, the, uh, the vast craft uh, that is much uh, better equipped to weather those waters. And then what surprised me as I, as I read the article beneath it was that this, this um, image was actually um, designed and distributed by a British organization committed to mental health during COVID. Uh, and so this, the idea here was that um, because of structural inequalities in society, some people are more um, vulnerable to mental health crises in the COVID, COVID moment than others, okay? But you can see how this, you know, if you're thinking of rising oceans and, and vulnerabilities, unequal vulnerabilities, how this carries over from the COVID context into a climate context. So one of the other things that we see carrying over from, clim from climate uh, concerns to COVID concerns is the, the, the history of anti-science, okay? So on the left, you have uh, climate change hoax, pathway to socialism. On the right, you have protesters claiming that COVID science is a hoax. Um, and what is, what is interesting and relevant is that this, these, these tropes of denialism uh, and doubt uh, are not just circulating psychologically, but they are uh, funded and mobilized by interested parties. So if we go back to um, another breath-related uh, political uh, and, and public health concern, which is lung cancer, and we go back to the 1960s, we had Philip Morris and other tobacco companies hiring a, a PR firm to deny that there was a connection between smoking and lung cancer. And so for a long time, um, the argument was uh, you cannot restrict uh, or advise against smoking because the science is not yet in, okay? So as, with as would happen with climate, uh, with these, the, these PR maneuvers, uh, it wasn't to say necessarily that the science is wrong, but that doubt persists and therefore we should not take legislative action, okay? So these are two books that look at that trajectory, how the very same company that was employed to see doubt in the link between smoking and, and lung disease was the same company that repurposed those arguments around doubt for sowing doubt in relation to climate change, okay? So these are, are two very uh, strong books on, on, on exactly that subject. So in the annals of anti-science, if we go back to the Flat Earth Society, we go back to Galileo's persecution, when you have uh, major shifts in the science, uh, there are interested parties who wish to defend the status quo. And so this applies uh, uh, both to the idea of the Earth is round and then later with this PR firm, Hill and Knowlton, uh, the, the, de the denial of the science, uh, the secure science of, of climate change and of COVID. So last year we saw uh, the, the muzzle, the, the mask become the muzzle uh, and a symbol on, on, on the right or particularly on the right, but in, in broadly speaking in terms of um, sowing doubt on the science, the idea that the mask symbolized the end of freedom, okay? Uh, the end of individual choice, okay? So this is another reading of the mask as uh, 
being worn by people who don't like to, um, who, who, are, who are villainous because they are suspect, okay? Uh, so, the question of civil rights, uh, the distribution of civil rights, uh, becomes very, very pertinent, clearly, both to the uh, anti, uh, to the COVID denialists, and also, as we'll subsequently see in Black Riots and Antler, the who, who gets civil rights and how do you define them? So, a common point of reference is John Stuart Mill on liberty. Freedom means doing as we like, subject to such consequences as may follow, without impediment from our fellow creatures, as long as what we do does not harm them, even though they should think our conduct foolish, perverse, or wrong. Okay? So this, became, this quote became a flashpoint in the arguments over, over COVID and what constitutes uh, unacceptable harm to those around us. So these are more images from the uh, uh, COVID denialists, okay? Uh, and this, this raises another question, uh, or another link, if you like, to the climate question. Um, don't burn our future. Uh, with climate, it's the young who are generationally most vulnerable to climate impacts, to the legacy, of, uh, of particulates uh, in, in, in the air, in the atmosphere. And the older implored to act now to reduce the future climate burdens imposed on younger generations, okay? Often appealing in the name of children and grandchildren. COVID flips this. Uh, typically speaking, uh, unless someone has underlying uh, comorbidities, the less vulnerable, uh, the young are less vulnerable and are being asked to make sacrifices on behalf of a viral threat that disproportionately endangers the elderly. Wear masks, take a financial or professional hit in order to protect your elders, okay? Uh, so we can see how these are relevant to that uh, John Stuart Mill quote. And the, how, how do we circumscribe liberty? How do we circumscribe responsibility? And in this case, how do those uh, questions speak to intergenerational injustice. So one of the most dramatic features of the past uh, couple of years has been the rise of these mega fires, these mega wildfires, um, as I say, in, in, in the American West, uh, in, in Siberia, in uh, much of the Mediterranean as well. And so this is a, a, a protest group at the Paris Climate Summit, Our, our Forests, Our Future. So it was an alliance of indigenous communities uh, in, in the Global South, uh, uh, from the Amazon, from uh, Central Africa, from Southeast Asia. And you know, if we think of dangerous professions, we might think of firefighter, we might think of sex worker, we might think of being a war correspondent, but um, in many of these communities, uh, which are remote from, typically remote from political power, in many of these communities, um, people are sacrificing their lives for the defense of the forest and beyond that, uh, the climate. Uh, and so well, I think last year, something like, uh, there was something like 730 environmental martyrs who were assassinated for their defense of uh, the forests, okay? Um, and as we know, in, particularly in the case of Brazil, uh, the, uh, under Bolsonaro, the open season on the Amazon uh, correlates to a large extent on an open season on indigenous lands. So the burning of lands to create uh, uh, large-scale ranches or soya or palm plantations, okay? Um, and this, this banner, this was in, in the French city of Bordeaux on the left. Uh, we are all pangolins. Uh, this was uh, a banner displayed during the, uh, the, the period when people came out on their balconies in France, Italy, New York, elsewhere, 
and bang pots and pans in support of the healthcare workers. Okay. And so to, how, how do we interpret this? Um, in looking at the roots of the uh, COVID crisis, uh, the pangolin is, a, is a, an important player because it's the most trafficked animal in the world. Okay? And um, it was, is, is very pr prominent in the, in the so-called wet markets of Wuhan. And it's also, as scientists are now believing, um, an intermediate species between bats, which are, uh, uh, w w which are major carriers of COVID viruses, uh, that the virus, the argument is the virus would go from the bat to the pangolin and then to humans. So why are humans trading and eating pangolins? Um, because uh, urban myth, uh, it's believed that the um, eating the scales, say in soup and that, uh, um, produces the greater virility. Okay. So the, again, we have the 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 intersection here of gender questions and climate questions. Uh, and many of the most embattled species are being trafficked precisely because of these arguments about um, consumption of their uh, body parts and enhanced virility. So if we think of shark fins, we think of rhino horn, we think of pangolin scales, we think of abalone, they're all marketed and, and acquire market value through um, this connection. Uh, alleged connection to virility. So, if we think of the spillover event, uh, the zoonotic event of COVID, um, it's connected also, uh, scientists believe, to uh, the practices of deforestation. Okay? And Andrew Dobson, who's an EEB, a professor in EEB here, and his team, have been mapping this. And their argument is that what happens with deforestation is you have the fragmentation of the forest. So you have more perimeters uh, in which you have human contact with creatures who previously uh, humans didn't have much contact with. Okay, um, And so what you have is unprecedented human, non-human interfaces resulting from deforestation, from forest fracture. Okay. And their argument is that this increases the likelihood of, um, of these uh, zoonotic spillover events. Okay. So uh, moving to the fourth section of the lecture, I'm wanting to think about wildfires, uh, climate emergency, and incarceration. Okay. So smoke from climate change intensified wildfires weakens the respiratory system. Okay? Exposure to such intense smoke makes people more susceptible to contracting and dying from COVID. Okay? So this is an important point if you're thinking about, uh, say, these mega fires in Australia or in uh, Oregon and California, is that at a time of COVID crisis, um, uh, these mega fires compromise the conditions of people's lungs um, in, in tackling what is essentially a respiratory pandemic. But there's, a, there's now a, a long history in, in California and Oregon uh, and Washington of um, using incarcerated people uh, as firefighters. So um, if we look at this history, uh, roughly 4,000 prisoners in California fight f uh, fires for $1 an hour, okay? Um, and then subsequently, then that is not regarded as training for when they leave jail. Uh, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a profound structural injustice here, um, both in the, the, the question of who is incarcerated and then also who is exposed to the health hazards of firefighting. Um, and so one of the things that COVID has raised is a, an awareness of how frontline workers uh, who, who, who are fundamental to the, the caring of the vulnerable in society, and these are health workers and, and firefighters among them, are, are uh, 
uh, disproportionately underpaid. Okay, so the 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 down the devaluing of that work, which is often associated with women and with in the U.S. with people of color. Okay. Um, and so, if we think about uh, about the this question of compound vulnerability, uh, the 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 structural injustice of uh, racist incarceration uh, impacts these other questions of climate and, um, and of COVID. So in the final section of, of the lecture, I just want to think a little bit about respiration and aspiration, about uh, breathing and social mobility. So this might seem like an unextraordinary image. It's from Beijing. Um, but what makes it perhaps extraordinary is that it was five years before COVID struck when um, this would have been a very defamiliarizing image. Now it's a very routine image. Uh, and it was people commuting to work in Beijing in a day of, uh, of uh, profound particulate pollution. And so there's a whole artistic tradition coming out of China uh, where, where artists have tried to, to grapple with and dramatize the health hazards associated uh, with particulates, particulate matter. Okay. Uh, that's one of them. And actually, Yizu, uh, Beijing Air Today. And so this, this artist just took photographs from their apartment every day. Um, to monitor as a way of monitoring the air. Um, and uh, as we know, uh, for a long time, the Chinese government didn't make the uh, particulate levels uh, public. And so the U.S. Embassy um, became a site, became a source that uh, millions of people went to to get a sense of how healthy the air was uh, on any given day, you know. Uh, and if we think of the, the metaphor of blue sky research, so, you know, scientists are always arguing for, for blue sky research, um, the idea of an open, of an open sky, uh, metaphorically, that it's not purpose-driven science, it's science for science's sake, and the belief in the value of that, that in, in turn has a metaphoric foundation of uh, uh, blue skies as being desirable, um, both in terms of light and in terms of the absence of pollution. Okay. So this is at Peking University. Um, a, a, a pair of protesters uh, conducted a marriage ceremony um, in, um, uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a ventilator and a mask. Um, and so this idea of in sickness and in, and in health, of, 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 of committing to a life, what does it mean to live, to celebrate life if the... Uh, if the air that you breathe um, is compromised, okay? This is from the same series of protests um, at Beijing University. I think what's so powerful about this image is that it focuses on the mouth. Uh, the one hand, uh, living in polluted air is like, you know, um, having plastic wrapped around you. You, you. You're constantly struggling for air that's not there. Uh, but the second dimension of this is the mouth is also the portal of speech, of self-expression. And so the X over the mouth here is also a statement about censorship. Okay? Um, it's about uh, the mouth as part of the, the, the breathing apparatus, but also the mouth as a vital form of, of self-expression, okay? Uh, and the mouth, of course, also is a, a site of human intimacy, of kissing and, uh, and, and physical connection, okay? And this was from last year during COVID, um, upstate New York, the woman on her right and a mother on her left put up this uh, sheet, um, in order to be intimate, okay? And so I've, I've, you know, in the aftermath of that uh, Chinese image, I thought this is a very powerful COVID image of the desire for intimacy and yet the, the fear of breath. 
the fear of what might be exhaled over you. Um, and so this connects with the Black Lives Matter movement in the following ways. Uh, if we go back to the uh, murder of Eric Garner in 2014, uh, probably many of you remember that his last words were, um, I can't breathe, which he uh, articulated 11 times. Um, and that became a, a, a symbolic focus. He obviously was not thinking about anything other than surviving. He wasn't thinking, oh, this is a slogan for a new movement. He was asthmatic. Uh, and when uh, the, the cops uh, who were implicated in his murder were, were uh, acquitted, um, there were two arguments that were, were wielded. One, that he was large, that he was a threatening, he was a large black man who was threatening, uh, uh, and therefore they had to tase him and, and uh, so forth. Uh, the second argument was that he was asthmatic, they couldn't have known that, and so he was implicated in his own death. Okay? Uh, and so from an environmental justice point of view, it's important to remember that Eric um, Garner grew up on Staten Island, which is by far the most polluted of the boroughs in New York. Okay? So his pre-existing condition of asthma was linked to structural injustice, to structural racism uh, about zoning laws, uh, which parts of the city are um, uh, protected, where the air is more protected, and which parts of the air of the city do people suffer air as a form of discrimination, okay? So for children growing up in uh, Staten Island and in the Bronx, uh, they're disproportionately uh, minority students and disproportionately uh, vulnerable to uh, having, having asthma, okay? So I think, you know, the case of Eric Garner is um, a case where you, where, where you can see uh, the convergence of the slow violence of, of structural injustice and the immediate brutality of uh, police violence. And so those two come together in these different time frames. Um, and so Eric Garner's words became a rallying cry uh, and here again, we we see the the, the multiple uh, forms of of the of the mask, uh, and, and the mask as a, a form of safety in relation to COVID. Uh, the mask as a site of protest, and uh, the mask also um, as a place uh, of anonymity, um, as 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 a as a cover in a sense. Okay. Uh, and so this uh, rallying cry took off, not just in across the U.S., but globally. And I can't breathe morphed into we can't breathe. Okay, this idea of the of the individual urgency of breath uh, morphing into this call for this cry for social transformation for breathing room. Um, and so this was a cartoonist uh, looking at the, at the relationship between the chokehold and the metaphor of yearning to breathe free. Um, as I said, the, this trope traveled around the world. Uh, this was an image from a motorway in South Africa that I alluded to briefly in, in the first lecture, um, where a street artist... Uh, on the edge of the shanty town, had 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 painted this uh, image, and the the sight of it is significant because it's in the shadow of a of a big coal-fired plant, one of the, one of the biggest in the country, um, and it's also a um, informal settlement. So it's of poor people uh, who are um, over-policed, uh, brutally policed, as most pe poor people are around the world. Uh, police are not as answerable in poorer communities. Um, and it's also alongside a highway. And so the highway leads from the Cape Town airport 
to the, the touristic hub of the center of the city. And the idea was that the authorities, that the informal settlements were unsightly, and so this wall was put up to obscure them so that the entry point into uh, the, the, the landscape of Cape Town was not, in their sense, compromised uh, by the site of these informal settlements. Okay? So you can see on, on a layered level, the, the, this community is subjected to pollution from the traffic from the motorway. They're su subjected to pollution from the coal-fired plants and also subjected to over-policing. And so you can see how that convergence zone might inspire an artist uh, like the street artist, anonymous street artist, uh, to uh, mobilize around a slogan that came from the other side of the earth. And I would say that um, one of the things that strikes me as somebody interested in environmental justice globally is how far this rallying cry tra traveled to Cairo, to Lagos, to Jakarta, to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it, it had a global resonance that I believe is connected to the physiology of breath, uh, to, to moments I think often probably in childhood where, where uh, you're gasping for breath, for, you feel insecure in your breath. Um, and so it's a very, very powerful example, I think, of a dead metaphor that has been brought to life by a social movement. This is um, in the West Bank uh, in Palestine, Israel. Um, so George Floyd here is, is uh, mobilized and reappropriated um, in relation to the separation barrier. So the, the war uh, segregating uh, Israel from uh, Palestine. Um, and so there are two layers to this. There's both the, the, the injustice of uh, the, the social asphyxiation, but also the allusion to segregation, to, to racial division, and um, uh, the, the unequal access between Israelis and Palestinians to the resources necessary for life. This is from an Indian uh, magazine, a prominent Indian magazine, I Can't Breathe. Um, in a number of Indian cities, uh, we, we have a compound breathing uh, crisis. Delhi may be the, the, the best known of them, where you have uh, uh, gasoline and diesel fuels from, from traffic congestion. You also have the burning in, in, the, in, the, in the dry season, the burning of the stubble fields around the city that, that compromises the air. Uh, it happens to coincide also with Diwali, with uh, the fireworks displays, the uh, mass fireworks displays, um, and with rising temperatures in the city uh, that further compromises breathing. So you have a, a kind of a perfect storm of the breathing crisis. But it was, it was interesting to me that, um, again, this magazine uh, picked up on this question, and then there was also a discussion of, well, which groups in the city are more vulnerable than others to, um, to breathing crises, okay? So, all of this connects to the question of, um, uh, of, of fuel poverty, of, of energy poverty, and one of the health issues that is relevant here is the question of where do people get their home energy from uh, for cooking and heating. And in uh, much of South Asia, in the Pacific, uh, Western Pacific, and in Africa, uh, millions upon millions or hundreds of millions of people are dependent on burning inside the home either coal or biomass, uh, 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 fuel from, from fallen trees, and so forth, OK? Uh, and so the, the more people, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is an image from a, 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 a Dalit home the, in, in India. Uh, so particularly people in poorer rural areas and a lower caste people. Uh, you have uh, women cooking over an open fire in a, an enclosed home. Okay? 
Uh, and so you have the convergence of questions of cost, of patriarchy, and of pollution uh, in relation to the disproportionate uh, mortality among uh, women in the home uh, who are, uh, um, whose days are largely confined inside the home where these fuels are being burnt and the particulates are being released. Um, this is, uh, for me, a, sort of a paradigmatic image of environmental injustice. Uh, it's in the shadow of uh, coal. Uh, Emalachleni is a city not far from Johannesburg where they have coal mining and where they have these big uh, coal-fired power plants that are used uh, largely to fuel the electricity grid in South Africa. So outside the gates of the, of the electric company, uh, there's a pile of leftover coal. And so these women are um, gleaning or pillaging from the, this, this heap to take the coal back to their homes so they can cook uh, indoors and so forth. Okay? So for me, why this captures uh, environmental justice is that these women are living in an informal community where they are subjected to the environmental harms coming from the coal-fired plant but they don't have the economic benefits of being on the electric grid, okay? So they're living intimately with the, with the damaging air, um, but they don't even get the, the, the benefits of energy security uh, that wealthier communities uh, have access to. So I wanted to end with this poem by Ross Gay which makes some of the links I've been talking about today. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec, horticultural department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which, most likely some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like cows and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Okay. Um, so we talked last time about Wangari Mathai and the planting of a tree as an investment in futures that we mayn't personally benefit from. Um, and here, I think there's a very powerful connection between Eric Garner's uh, murder from um, the constriction of his breath in relation to his work in the parks and the connection to the broader processes, the life-giving processes of photosynthesis. So I'll leave it there. Um, in terms of expectations, uh, you know, I'd like you to think about the similarities and difficulties and differences between the challenges and impacts posed by climate change and COVID. I'd like you to consider the diverse ways in which the symb symbol of the mask has been mobilized in relation to COVID, air pollution, and, climate, and Black Lives Matter. And then to think finally about why the reasoning why I Can't Breathe became such a rallying cry became what Anna Tsing calls a traveling allegory, okay? Uh, what, where, where does its power come from? Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks.